Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all are doing okay here at the end of the first chapter of winter term. Uh, yeah, good times, I'm sure, are being had by all. Uh, today, I think we're going to wrap up kind of the first half of the course, the stage setting, and then we uh, will cash all our checks uh, when we come back after reading break. Uh, and I want to spend today doing a little bit more just to wrap up and get through the interstellar medium section, and then I'll do a brief data exercise um, that uh, uses the globular clusters uh, information. Uh, there are some slides for the second half of the talk uh, that are kind of posted uh, there, and if you want to grab that and the globular clusters.csv file that's on eClass uh, while we're getting set up, you can go ahead and do so, which will allow you to um, uh, follow along at home while we are uh, doing interesting uh, finding the structure of the galaxy. Uh, before we get rolling, do you have any questions? Well, uh, without further ado, uh, let's talk about supernova explosions. Uh, so our goal today is to basically derive the time evolution of two types of supernova explosion. Uh, the two phases that we consider are the adiabatic phase, which is conserving energy, and this later snowplow phase, which is uh, where a radiative cooling has become important, that conserves momentum. And this was the setup that we developed where we had a supernova explosion in the center, and then it drives out and essentially evacuates a uh, shell that is going to have a significantly lower density than the ambient medium that's expanded into. And so the mass of material here in the supernova shell is basically going to be the mass of gas that was in this spherical volume prior to the supernova explosion. It basically whoosh, swells and uh, builds it all up. And that means that as the supernova shock front gathers up material, uh, the mass of that shell is going to be uh, just the spherical volume, 4 pi over 3 times r cubed, uh, times the mass density of the material that it's sweeping up. That kind of just gives you the total conservation of the mass. And then uh, we write down the energy of a supernova, and we say that that energy goes off, and that converts into the kinetic energy of the material that it is sweeping up. So essentially you explode and so this is always going to be 10 to the 44 joules or whatever the value of the explosion happens to be. So what this means is the um, we're going to operate here in this energy conservation and this is going to give us the, uh, the expression that we need and so if we substitute in the mass here and then we recognize that V is the time derivative of the radius of the shell then what we get is we just get a constant times the radius cubed times the derivative of the radius squared is equal to a constant energy of a supernova explosion. So this gives us the ability to solve for the time evolution of the supernova. Before I do that, I have lied to you. I've been a horrible, horrible lying person. This part is not exactly true. To get it just right, you need to study the detailed physics of shocks and you get a slightly different constant out front here as a result of that. Um, and the reason is that the energy conserving shock front doesn't accelerate the material to necessarily exactly the same speed here because it is also heating up the material that's left behind. In the interior of this shock front here, this is million Kelvin hot ionized medium gas, and the stuff out here is frequently warm neutral medium, uh, so it elevates its temperature by a factor of 100, and that also has to come from the energy of the supernova explosion. We don't include that in this analysis. So a little bit of a lie, but the scaling is all there, and so we're just going to roll on because, hey, Astro. Okay, uh, so we can actually solve this uh, differential equation. Um, it is one of the like six classes of differential equations that you can actually solve. Pretty impressive that they make you take two semesters to say here's six problems you can do, but hey, it's math for you. Um, and so what we're going to do is uh, make, uh, solve this expression, and like all good differential equations, uh, we're going to put it into a relatively simplified form uh, by noting that um, we'll solve this for a constant, uh, multiply the constant to the other side, and get 3 times the energy of the supernova 
over uh, 2 pi rho naught is equal to a constant, I'll give it a big value, uh, letter big K, is equal to R cubed times dr by dt squared. And any time, so this is a first order differential equation, and any time you see an expression like this where it's just a single term, or uh, basically, yeah, I, I won't go into the theory of why this is a good guess, but we can always make a good guess in form of a power law here. And so we conjecture a solution of the form R is equal to bt to the a plus c, where c is a constant and b and a are also unknown parameters of the problem. And we want to try the solution and find out the values of a, b, and c so that we get a valid expression for the supernova. And we can do one really quick, um, which is as t goes to zero, we also know that the radius has to go to zero. Uh, basically, that means that you know, the supernova explosion started at r equals zero, and as such, that implies that c must be equal to zero. So we can just drop the constant right off of here, so zero. Then we just plug this in, uh, expression, this remaining expression here, into the, uh, into the explosion equation, and uh, we get that, oops, head back to that, and we get that k, is equal to sub in the parameter for r, uh, b t to the eighth power, and that's r cubed there, so I cubed the whole thing. And then I take the time derivative of that and square it. So the time derivative is a b t to the a minus one, so that is a b t to the a minus one quantity squared, and then I expand this out, and then I get that that is b to the fifth t to the 3a times a squared uh, times t to the 2a minus 2. I'll neaten that up a little bit and get b to the fifth times t to the 5a minus 2 times a squared is equal to a constant. Since it's equal to a constant, that gives us a further constraint. So that uh, since k is a constant, then uh, we know that uh, t must be proportional, or uh, so let's write it this way. R, that's not an eraser. That's, oh my gosh, it's a big eraser. Uh, so, man, uh, things went off the rails here. K is a constant. Then we know that R must be proportional to T to the zero. It's a constant. There's no time variation in it. Therefore, that's what the value uh, on the index must be. So that implies that 5A minus 2 must be equal to zero. So A has to go like two-fifths. Uh, so, cool. So we can put that in there and then we get, uh, so this must be b to the fifth times two fifths quantity squared, t to the five a minus two is a constant, so that's one, is equal to k. So that implies that b to the fifth is equal to 25 fourths k is equal to 75 e supernova over eight pi rho not, and so that implies that b is equal to the fifth root of that, 75 e supernova over 8 pi rho naught to the one fifth. And so that means that, hey, we're all good. Um, we have solved every part of this, and I'm going to just zip up here, because that's where I have some white space, I can stay on the same uh, uh, board. And so that means that I know that r of t must be equal to, just all together now, 75 e supernova over 8 pi rho naught raised to the 1 fifth times t to the 2 fifths. And so that's the radius value. And I can also calculate how fast that shock, uh, the shock front is moving uh, So by taking a time derivative. So I get that v of t is just equal to 2 fifths times this mess in the constant again, 75e supernova over 8 pi rho naught to the 1 fifth 
And I take one power off of the t, so I get t to the minus three-fifths, which is kind of a cool little scaling. Uh, it tells us that the radius is expanding, uh, and the velocity is declining over time, so it's expanding continuously and slowing down. And you'll notice it has the slightly awkward value that at the very small times, the uh, velocity diverges to infinity. But essentially, once you get so close to the supernova explosion, you have to couple it into the initial launch at you know 10,000 kilometers per 30, 10 to 30,000 kilometers per second. And so that's sort of where you would stop it at the scale of a star. Uh, but then it kind of couples into this after that initial explosion and kind of picks up this limiting case. So, you know, a few hours after a supernova explosion, we are then on here. We don't actually run it all the way to zero. Okay, so that's a kind of a neat little solution that we can just derive by writing down this simple model of a gas explosion going off in a galaxy and gives us a sense of the shock front. Any questions about that? No unmuting, no typing. I guess we're doing okay. So uh, let me ask you, if a supernova explosion has an energy of 10 to the 44 joules and goes off into a medium with particle density of 10 to the 6 per meter cubed, uh, so that gives you this mass density here, how long after the explosion does V equal 250 kilometers per second? And so I helpfully reproduced for you uh, the expression there, and you all can have some fun uh, doing some solvent. Yeah, that's right. Yep.
All right. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, so um, it was pointed out that I hadn't posted the slides here, which I thought I did, which means somewhere on E-Class there are these slides, just not where I think they're supposed to be. I just put up uh, the updated notes here. Sorry if you were uh, thrown for a loop by that. Um, anyways, uh, so this is a, uh, you know, basically it's, you know, we want to find T at a given V, so we invert the equation. And uh, we have 8 pi rho naught over 75 e supernova to the 1 fifth um, is t and a 3 fifths. So then we can start doing some raising. So 5 times 2.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second over 2 times, then we do. 8 pi rho naught is the 1.67 times 10 to the negative 21 kilogram meter cubed per meter cubed. Uh, divide that by 75 times the 10 to the 44 joules. Raise all of that to the 1 fifth power. And then inside this, we do this to the minus 5 thirds power. And when you evaluate all of that, uh, you get about 1.2 times 10 to the 12 seconds, uh, which is, for context, 39,000 years. Which is significant, but really pretty short in the grand scheme of galactic evolution. So these are you know, fast uh, explosions that move outward, gets to a size of a few tens of parsecs at this point. I think this is 24 parsecs for the canonical supernova explosion. So it pops up pretty big uh, here. And you know, it's slowing down the whole time. Uh, so this is the uh, kind of characteristic scale. And the reason why we care about uh, this particular speed is that's about the time that the um, slow, uh, that the cooling kicks in. And so this kind of 250 kilometer per second is the characteristic shock speed where we see uh, a rise in density and a decrease in temperature so that our inside the shock front, we encounter this cooling peak where the cooling goes up by one and a half orders of magnitude. And we know that a cooling time then is going to shorten significantly. So it's gonna drop from thousands of years, uh, you know, beyond thousands of years to just a few hundreds of years. And it's going to then drop down in temperature quite precipitously. And so what happens is we enter this snowplow phase of the supernova explosion when the shock front is radiative. And we see that, like this is a sort of a cross section of the Veil Nebula, which is a supernova explosion. I think it's in Cygnus, um, uh, where we uh, see this little branch here. This is a zoom in taken with Hubble. And these are your run of the mill uh, emission lines, oxygen three, nitri uh, H alpha, nitrogen two. All the stuff that you see in supernova explosion or in H2 regions is right here. So that's telling us we're seeing gas at temperatures of about uh, 10 to 20,000 Kelvin uh, right here. And this ends up being a very thin shock front. And the reason is, is back here is million Kelvin gas coming out of the explosion. And so that has a fairly high pressure. Uh, and so even though this is expanding here at these high speeds, 250 kilometer per second, the sound speed here is at least that, if not more. And so what that does is the pressure kind of pushes this uh, shock front to be quite thin. Uh, and radiative. So it is thin and it's losing energy. So it can no longer be adiabatic. We have to switch from the energy being the conserved quantity to the momentum being the conserved quantity. And that happens at a characteristic velocity or a shock speed of about 250 kilometers per second. Um, and that is, uh, uh, and that leads to a fixed sort of radius and time, given the parameters of the density of the medium and the super uh, and the times uh, the the density of the medium and the size at which uh, the supernova shock is when it transitions from energy conserving to momentum conserving. So 
we can then carry out a parallel derivation for how the shock front evolves in this case where the momentum of the shell is conserved. And here we use a model of the mass of the shell times the speed of the shell being a constant from this time on when v naught is 250 kilometers per second and r naught is whatever r is when we slow down to 250 kilometers per second and then we say that the mass in the shell continues to be swept up so we have this 4 pi over 3 r cubed times rho naught and so from here we can do a parallel solution to what we did earlier uh, we, a, a parallel solution to what we did earlier and figure out the uh, evolution, the radius of the uh, explosion with time. And so the very first thing I'm going to do is realize that the density of the medium doesn't matter at this point. We are momentum conserving, so it doesn't really affect the dynamics of this at all, and we get a self-similar solution. So we end up with uh, that r cubed uh, times dr by dt, that's the actual equation, is a constant, r naught cubed times v naught, which I'll leave as v naught uh, just you know, as a characteristic uh, velocity. And then I'm going to do a variable substitution. This sort of works best as a scale, as a parameter-free uh, estimate. I'm going to say that little r here, I'm going to define to be r over r naught, so its radius relative to the initial radius, and then d little r by dt is just 1 over r naught times uh, d big r by dt. And from there I can massage this particular expression to be r cubed times uh, r naught times d little r by dt. And so that r naught that I introduce here cancels the r naught in my dimensionless scaling. You can't see that unless I draw it over here. Uh, and then that is, e oops, um, is equal to v naught. Uh, so I've divided through by an r naught cubed here uh, to get, that, get to that expression. So from here, I'll just slow that r naught to the other side. So from there, I get r cubed times dr by dt is equal to v naught over big r naught. So this gives us the pieces that we need. I realize I don't have my Discord showing just in case. Okay, we're good. Uh, yep. And so then this is going to give us a equation that we can solve. This, unlike the previous, which is just sort of a direct substitution of power law, this is a separable uh, first order equation. So I'll basically uh, engage in gross abuse of differential forms and multiply both sides by a dt. Uh, so we get r cubed times dr is equal to v naught over r naught times dt. So split up that dr by dt and then integrate both sides. So I'll integrate r cubed from whatever r naught is to my final radius. I'll just call that a uh, big R. And then I'll integrate t from t naught up to whatever my time is, uh, t. And so then these integrals are fairly straightforward. Uh, oh, sorry, no, I uh, should be careful here. I'm integrating the dimensionless variable. So if I'm integrating the dimensionless variable goes from one, which is r over r naught equals one, so r naught, up to whatever my r final is. Um, and from there, I can carry out this integral. And so that gives me r final to the fourth over four minus one fourth is equal to this characteristic scale of the problem, v naught over r naught times t minus t naught. And from there, I can just solve for uh, r final is equal to the, push the one quarter to the other side, multiply by four, so we get one plus four v naught over r naught t minus t naught all raised to the one fourth power, and then I'll restore the dimensionality of this expression. R is equal to R naught times one plus four V naught over R naught T minus T naught to the one fourth. So the transition, this 250 kilometers per second is the linking between 
this energy conserving phase and this momentum conserving phase. And you'll notice that the radius was scaling with time to the two fifths power in the energy conserving phase. In the momentum conserving phase, it's expanding more slowly and follows t to the one fourth power uh, here. So it sort of slows down and then ultimately dissipates into the medium. So uh, before I kind of talk about the end game of supernova explosions, are there any questions about that? Take it away. Ah, so yeah, let me unpack that a little bit. So you're basically saying going from here to here, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, let me do that and, and uh, let me fill out an extra step here. Uh, so what I did here was I first uh, divided both sides by the r naught cubed, r naught cubed, r naught cubed times dr by dt. And for the time variable, I want this expression. Uh, so to get that, I need a one over r naught here. Oops, I can't do it that way. I need a one over r naught here. And so to cancel out that r naught, I have to put, introduce one in the numerator there. And that's all equal to v naught. And so that's where this one over r naught comes from, is that this one is canceling with this one. Uh, because then this expression, that is little r cubed. And then this expression is dr by dt. And so I have this extra r naught to cancel out in the non-dimensionalization of the velocity unit. Is that clearer? Yeah. Not a problem. All right. So the last thing to talk about in the interstellar medium is the end state of these supernova explosions. They're expanding out and constantly slowing down. Uh, and so they you know, pop up and then slowly uh, reach uh, a velocity where the speed of the shock front approaches the sound speed in the medium. And so when your Mach number gets close to one, you know, within a factor of a couple of one, then the external pressure forces become significant enough that they can cross in and mess with the supernova explosion shock front and dissipate it. So once uh, that's the condition for a supernova media, uh, remnant being no longer distinct with the interstellar medium is that local pressure forces become significant with respect to the shock front pushing out and sound waves can propagate across uh, the medium, kind of chewing up the shock front and dissipating it here. And so the time it takes for this to happen is about 300,000 years for a typical supernova explosion going off in you know typical neutral medium within the galaxy. And going all the way back to the beginning of this unit, you can sort of see that there are these very visible supernova explosions uh, that are going off in the medium. They're clear. They're these quasi-spherical uh, structures that are detonating off here. And then you also see all this other hot ionized medium stuff that is in the plane. Those are late stage supernova remnants that other shock fronts and sound waves and the interaction with the rest of the gas has become significant enough that it can kind of chew up the shock front and make this all disappear. It's no longer these nice little spherical shells. Instead, it's encountering uh, the other gas in the medium. So this is an earlier supernova explosion. This is a later set of supernova explosions. This is probably multiple explosions here that have gone off here. So that's how these shock fronts end. And the reason we want to talk about this is that these shock fronts are stirring the interstellar medium. These are one of the primary sources of energy injection into the gas of a gas 
galaxy. And a big question we have is, well, why doesn't the gas in the galaxy all just kind of collapse and form stars? And the answer is, anytime you form a star, you get, or a bunch of stars, you'll get some high mass stars, and those high mass stars will explode in these supernova explosions, and then hit the interstellar medium with these shock waves, and it will provide the stuff that we've been calling feedback, which basically halts the star, the collapse to star forming state and the cooling down to this cold molecular medium. It heats it up, it hits it with these shocks, and it destroys it. And so we start to see the clues of a self-regulating process of star formation in disks. Whereas if you, things start to collapse too much, you will get too much star formation, you'll get a higher rate of supernova explosions, which will stir up the medium further. And so this nice kind of, it's not steady state, it's not equilibrium, but it's uh, kind of in this equipartition where it is constantly cycling between the media with this, uh, this feedback cycle here. So I think that's, yep, that's all we're going to say. Uh, any questions about interstellar medium before we talk globulars? All right. Let's change topics briefly. I want to talk a little bit about globular clusters because the next thing that we're going to be doing in class is examining the structure of the galaxy and ask why do we see the structure that we do. Uh, and one of the neat thing, uh, one of the tracers of galactic structure, one of the features of our galaxy, we've been so focused on gas lately, you almost forget there are stars in it, but uh, there we see a bunch an abundance of star clusters throughout the uh, galaxy. And we broadly classify these into two types of galaxies. We call these glob uh, or two types of clusters. Uh, and we often call them globular clusters and open clusters. And so this is a picture over here is gorgeous little globular cluster uh, there. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of stars in it. And then you have something like this one over here. That's an open cluster. And you'll notice what makes this glob this open cluster picture interesting is it has this beautiful little uh, media, uh, chunk of nebulosity around it, which indicates hmm, maybe something's going on with the interstellar medium here. And in general, we sort globular clusters versus open clusters under a couple of uh, sort of different uh, axes here. So globular clusters tend to be uh, spherical. They tend to be have a central concentration of mass. So if you look back over here, there's more stars here in the center than there are out in the exterior. Uh, they're old. They ha have ages that are consistent with being as old as the galaxy or more. They're high mass with a mass of 100,000 solar masses being kind of typical. Uh, they're very dense. They're parsec scale or a few parsec scale. Uh, they're metal poor and they're gravitationally bound and they tend to be found in what we call the halo of a galaxy. More on that later. Open clusters are the opposite of all those things. They tend to be irregular in shape. So if we compare this has doesn't have this nice sort of spherical symmetry over here uh, that we see uh, in that case. Uh, they tend to be young associated with recent star formation, hence the nebulosity and the local interstellar medium. Uh, they tend to have lower characteristic masses, uh, 100 to 10,000 uh, solar masses. Uh, lower density, they're found in metal-rich regions, or they are metal-rich. Uh, they can be bound or unbound. Um, we only see the bound ones uh, we only see the unbound ones when they're young, because otherwise they dissipate into the galaxy. And they are typically found in the disk of a galaxy. But the boundaries are murky. And so this is a good Astro 122 level description of clusters. But there are there's a continuum of cluster properties here. And so this dichotomy between open and globular clusters is false at best, since there's a fair bit of high young mass clusters and old stellar populations that are in lower mass uh, irregular structures. But it's, it's kind of a nice kind of axis under which we can compare the populations of stellar clusters. So from the Gaia diagram, you may remember that there is this contrast that we see for uh, the HR diagrams of globular and open clusters. And so I, there's this beautiful picture here that showed a globular cluster in this, I don't know, what would you call it, magenta? 
and then the open cluster here in blue uh, in the Gaia data. And I notice here that the red giant branch for the globular cluster and the red giant branch for the open cluster are shifted relative to each other. And so uh, throw your memory back and tell me what's the main reason that that is true? All right, take a few more seconds, plug in an answer. All right. So the main, oop, yeah, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, the most people said that it is less reddened by dust. Uh, but the core answer, this is actually intrinsic uh, colors. They don't have as much foreground. The actual answer here is that these are metal pore systems. And metal pore systems, the key factor there is they have lower opacity in their stars. And so they tend to be hotter and more luminous. And if they're hotter, they shift to the blue side of the HR diagram. And so the key factor here is not where they are on the sky, but the intrinsic property of the cluster it being metal poor is what makes it shift a little bit uh, to the blue side. All right, um, I'm gonna hop on. Anybody wanna uh, shout about anything? All right, I just wanna take a few minutes now and show that globular clusters are very useful because they're this halo population of stars and we can use them to infer the center of the Milky Way uh, from the distribution of the globular clusters. And this was work that was sort of uh, uh, developed by this observer named Shapley in the 1920s as evidence that the sun was not at the center of the Milky Way. And if you had beautiful Gaia data like this, you might get a sense as we look towards one part of the sky. Uh, this part of it here looks a little brighter. And so maybe something's going on off in that direction of the sky, but there's all this crud in this way, all these clouds and stuff. And that confounds our ability to really make clean measurements of where we are in the galaxy. And this has led to models very early on of what our role in the galaxy looked like from this model from this observer Herschel back in 1700s, you know, 18th century astronomy. And uh, the sun is indicated down here with that little point here. And uh, uh, Herschel's observations were able to deduce that the galaxy was thinner in one direction than the other. We would later call this out of the galactic plane. Uh, we're sitting in a disk of stars and we're looking out of the galactic plane. But Herschel also observed that there were these uh, weird extensions and still kind of came up with a sort of limited view in the direction of the disk. And the reason of that is this dust. So these little fingers of extinction coming in here prevent us seeing very far into the galaxy. But uh, what we can do is we're, you know, so we're sort of in a modern view situated here uh, in the disk of the galaxy, far away from the center. But there are all of these globular clusters distributed in this kind of spherical distribution around the galactic center. And so what we want to do is use the distribution of these to give us a sense of where we are in the galaxy. So let's hop on over to glue. Glue. And throw that out of the way. And give this a go. All right. Uh, there's a, I can show you this really quickly. If you hop into uh, your E class, 
there's a file here called globular clusters. There's also a homework six, if you're excited about that. That appeared last night, handcrafted and organic uh, for your enjoyment. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to load up that globular clusters file. And all it is, is a bunch of uh, globular clusters named things like NGC 104. And it gives us a galactic coordinates and how far away it is. This is amalgamated from Gaia uh, distances, literature work, a bunch of statistical techniques to figure out the distances to the globular clusters. And this crew has kind of figured out where all these clusters were. And so what I want to do is transform those into a Cartesian coordinate system uh, using the same model. I'm going to go over it again just because I ask you to do something similar on your uh, homework six. So I can figure out uh, the uh, galactic positions by saying, well, this must be the distance uh, times np dot cosine of L times np dot pi over 180 times np dot cos b times np dot pi over 180. That pi over 180 is converting from radians to degrees here. And we have x gal. So hey, that's cool. That's a valid expression. Let's copy paste, copy it, because I'm going to paste it in a second. I'll create a y gal. And there I have to change my, that to be a sign of the galactic longitude. And then I can create a Z gal, which is just only the latitude, and it's the sign of that. So that uses the expressions in chapter one to make this conversion to a three dimensional coordinate system. And then all I got to do is make a little plot, and let's see what our 3D volume looks like here. Because, you know, what the heck. And so I can do x gal, y gal, and z gal, and uh, there's everything. Oops, did I do? I did two y gals, otherwise I get a pancake. All right, uh, so this is kind of cool. That's the three dimensional view of globular clusters in our galaxy. Uh, lots of stuff, weird stuff going on out here. And then there's this tiny little cluster in here. Let's take a closer look. So if we zoom in, we can see that the zero, zero point is here-ish. Not all the business is happening over here. Uh, we can see that a little clearer if I just make a two-dimensional plot. If I make a two-dimensional plot, there we go, and show that as x gal versus hammer atoff. No. Uh, let's make that y gal and this x gal. I did it again. There we are. And make this nice and big. Zero, zero is where the sun is located. And that's this point. And almost all of the globular clusters are off in one direction on the sky. And since they're off in one direction in the sky, they're kind of orbiting around the center of something that's not us. And this was kind of the first clue that we had that we were not at the center of the galaxy. And in fact, in this coordinate system set up in longitude and latitude, we can figure out where the center of the galaxy is. And GLUE gives us that capability uh, by... Uh, I mean, we can even, and in fact, what you can sort of see is that the offset is mostly in X gal uh, here, or, and so where it's at uh, X gal zero, zero, and the offset here is in the X direction. So I can get even more refined and just show a one dimensional profile of the X uh, data and Zoom in here and we see, uh, let's give us some more bins. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah. There we are. We see that there's this peak right here. And so what I want to do is actually figure out how far offset we are uh, from the center of the globular cluster uh, distribution. And so that calls for some math. I'll throw this in here. And uh, we'll call that, actually it's already in here as the data collection, right? 
DC, boop, cool, DC zero. And we want the X coordinates of that. Oh, there's all the X coordinates. And if I bring in my NumPy, I can figure out what the mean value of the data collection zero X gal value is. And pop. It pops it out and it says the mean of that value is at about 6.7. Okay, that's pretty cool. The spike is a little closer to eight. And something you can do is say, well, maybe it's being thrown off by us not seeing uh, globular clusters on the other side of the galaxy very effectively. So we can consider a different central estimator of X scale. We're going to use the median. Let's see if that gives us a different value. 7.2. Okay, so this is pretty cool. Uh, what this is saying is that we're not located at the center of the galaxy. The globular clusters seem to indicate we are located off at another distance. But using this information, we can figure out roughly where the galactic center is. It's about seven, six to seven kiloparsecs in the L equals zero direction, so towards the galactic center. And that squares up with the model that we have been developing and all these pictures that you've been looking at kind of historically. Uh, if you go back here uh, and you see, we're saying that the distance that we're measuring here based on the globular cluster distribution, so here to here, that value we're guessing is about seven kiloparsecs. And that's uh, a quick observation that we can make just by using the globular clusters. So I thought that was a neat thing to do. And it also showcased some techniques that you would need to execute on your um, uh, homework set six. All right. Any questions about that? Fantastic. Well, that's a wrap. I will see you in CSIS L1047 uh, on Monday the 28th at 1 p.m. And uh, as a reminder, uh, I will. Tr I am going to do my best to make a recording of the lectures. I do not have nearly the nice setup that I do in the lecture hall as I do here, so the quality won't be there. Uh, but the content will be, you'll at least hear what I have to say uh, about that. So you can follow along on video if you can't make it home or you're sick or, or you can't make it to Edmonton or you're sick or whatever. All of the stuff in class is set up so that the only thing you really need to be present for is the final exam. Uh, so if you're not coming back to Edmonton for whatever reason, uh, come on in, grab a hotel, take a final exam. And we'll see you. Uh, uh, we'll see you there. Otherwise, uh, I will see some of you on Monday in CSIS. And yep. Yeah, until then, have a lovely reading break.